I love that passage in Ephesians that uh, Brett read for us. It's one of the prayers that uh, Paul uh, says that he prays for the church. Uh, and specifically in there, he talks about some of the theology of the resurrection. Um, he talks about uh, how uh, God in Christ uh, worked his great power when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So we have there uh, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and his ascension as well as God raised him up and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places above every uh, power and might and dominion and every name that is named and made him head over all things for the church. And so we have some of the theology there of the resurrection and what that means for us as his church. Those same themes, though, are, are also spoken about in John chapter 20 when we read of the narrative of the resurrection. John tells us the story, of course, uh, in his own words of Jesus his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And we come in chapter 20, we had come to uh, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will also speak about his ascension, you will see, as uh, we get down into the scripture today. But only John's gospel tells us the story of Mary Magdalene, meeting Jesus at the empty tomb. I think Mary may have told John about it personally. You remember in chapter 19 that Jesus had, had, uh, had when he was dying on the cross, that Mary was there uh, with Jesus, watching uh, him on the cross. Mary Magdalene was, along with some other women. We also know that she went to the tomb and watched where he was buried. Now she is the first, it seems, to go to the tomb on Sunday morning, the first day of the week. And everything about this encounter of Mary and Jesus is, is just beautiful. Uh, we find a weeping woman lingering by an empty tomb, wondering what has happened to the body of the one that she loved. When Jesus suddenly appears, she doesn't recognize him. And then when he calls her name, she grips his feet so tightly, it seems, he has to tell her to let go. Finally, the, the mourner becomes a missionary running to tell others that she has seen the Lord. Now, the background for these verses is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10 that we studied last time. Mary Magdalene finally uh, is, uh, is there uh, on, on that first uh, Easter morning. She is the first to arrive at the tomb very early, John tells us. While it was still dark, they left to go to the tomb. Um, so it's very early Sunday morning. They, they discover, uh, Mary and the other women who had come with her, discover that the stone was taken away. Alarmed, she uh, takes off uh, running to tell Peter and John and exclaims to them in verse 2, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter and John, of course, jump up and they immediately ran to the tomb. And John got there first, but just looked in. And then Peter... Uh, brushes back past John at the entrance of the tomb and goes in. Finally, John goes in as well, and they both see the grave clothes lying there and the, the face covering folded up in a separate place by itself. And John says that he believed. 
But Peter went away still, still pondering what had happened. Neither man, as John tells us, yet understood from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Well, after viewing the empty tomb, both of these men return home. That's the end of verse 10. Meanwhile, Mary has returned to the tomb, and we pick up her story in verse 11. You follow along as I read John chapter 20, starting in verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy, inspired word. We thank you for our risen Lord Jesus Christ and for your spirit who teaches us. Father, we pray that even today, through your word, you would speak directly to our hearts that Jesus lives, taking away our sorrow, causing us to worship, and sending us to witness. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, we come to the story, uh, the rest of the story here, about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is one of at least five different women in the New Testament named Mary. You could easily get them confused. Uh, she probably came from the village of Magdala, which was uh, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus did much of his ministry in and around Galilee. Jesus, Luke tells us, had cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene, setting her free from these evil spirits. She became one of a group of women who followed Christ and provided financial support uh, for his ministry out of their own means. Now, some have speculated that she was the woman caught in adultery that we met in John chapter 8, or possibly the sinful woman who was forgiven much because she loved much and who anointed the feet of Jesus in Luke chapter 7. But the Bible doesn't identify her with either of those two women. There's no reason for us to think that she is. This much we know. She is living proof that those whom the Son has set free are free indeed. Having been liberated from her demonic bondage, seven demons. If you would think if one is bad, seven is really bad. And the Lord has set her free. And so having been set free, she loves the Lord. And she is determined to follow him. And she follows him 
to the very end. And when our Lord hung on the cross, she stood nearby Mary, his mother, and the other women who had gathered there at the cross. She witnessed him, his body taken down from the cross and, and where Joseph laid him in the tomb that Friday evening. She had prepared spices and fragrant oils to finish anointing his body for burial and that's why she was coming on that Sunday morning. And so early in the morning, before the sun came up, she and the other women ventured through the darkness to the garden. Now if we piece together the different accounts from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it seems that Jesus had risen from the dead sometime before dawn on that first day of the week, on that resurrection Sunday. There was an earthquake, uh, Matthew tells us, and an angel came and rolled the stone away from the tomb and sat on it. The guards who were there guarding the tomb were uh, struck uh, unconscious, just like dead men. Uh, Matthew tells us that they were terrified when they saw the angel and the earthquake and the stone being rolled away. And, uh, and so they fall down that way. When they awoke, I assume they fled because we find them later reporting to the chief priests uh, what had happened. Uh, as much as they knew anyway. When the women found the stone rolled away from the tomb, then Mary Magdalene rushes off to tell Peter and John. Now it may have been while she was gone that the other women saw the angels who told them that Jesus was risen from the dead, as you can read about in Matthew and in Luke. Those women, uh, as, as uh, Mark tells us, ran from the tomb in fear. And initially was tell they were telling no one. Uh, but later we find uh, that they met Jesus after Mary had. And with joy, they go and tell the disciples. Well, in the meantime, uh, as uh, after these women have seen the angels and, and have left the tomb area, Peter and, and John arrive at the tomb. They see the grave clothes. John believes, and they return to their homes wondering about what had happened. And at this point, Mary Magdalene returns. She's confused. She's bewildered. She's in shock frightened, broken-hearted. It has not yet occurred to her that the empty tomb meant that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so we find that Mary weeps. We find Mary weeping. In fact, John puts great emphasis on that. He, he mentions it twice in verse 11, and then the angels ask her about it, and Jesus asks her about it. In verse 11, it says, But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. The word for weeping here means to mourn to wail aloud, to a lament as a sign of pain or grief. Now, it's not unusual, is it, to find mourners wailing at the tomb of a loved one who has died? Lazarus' sister Mary and the Jews who were with her, they were weeping at the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11. And so what is unusual in this case here in John chapter 20 is that the body of Jesus is not in the tomb. If the tomb is empty, why is she still there? Well, 
If you've ever lost a loved one who meant more to you than life itself, you know why she was there. She loved Jesus. She loved him in life, and now she loved him in death. She served Jesus in life, and now she meant to serve him in his death. But she can't. He's not there. And she's weeping over an empty tomb. What should have been good news broke her heart because the only thing that she can think is that someone must have stolen the body. It wasn't enough that she had watched her her beloved Lord Jesus die that cruel and awful death on the cross. It wasn't enough that she saw his his body taken down and carried and, and laid dead in a tomb. But now, it was the ultimate indignity that evil men, she thinks, have taken the body. And so her grief was unrestrained. It was immeasurable. Verse 12 says, when she looked into the tomb, she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Did she recognize these angels? Did she know they were angels? John tells us they were in white, as angels are often described in in the scriptures as as wearing white or in garments that were shining with light. It connects them with with the glory of God and, and His purity. It connects them with heaven. But their very presence and their very position in the tomb is a message and it's a ministry to Mary. It's a message and a ministry to her. First, we find that their, their position, there as one at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus had been laid, kind of reminds us of Exodus chapter 25, where Moses gets the instructions for the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant, in which was placed the Ten Commandments, and on that Ark of the Covenant, which was to be a symbol of the presence of God with His people, there was the mercy seat or the atonement cover. And on either side of that mercy seat were angelic figures that were carved and and covered with gold shining figures called cherubim. A cherubim on one end and a cherubim on the other end. And John describes it here almost exactly like that. An angel at the head and an angel at the feet. And so the very presence of the angels is proclaiming that Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh who has come out of the Holy of Holies to reveal Himself as the living Lord. But it was not only a message, it was also a ministry to Mary. In verse 13, the angels begin to minister to her. They say to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And when they ask, woman, why are you weeping? The inference is that her tears were not really necessary. They were uncalled for. Yes, they were tears of love. They were tears of sorrow. They, but they were ill-founded. She replies that she's weeping because they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. See, in Mary's mind, this was the the darkest moment of her life. And yet her tears were based on false assumptions here. 
She assumed Jesus was dead still. That his body had been stolen. That she would not be able to find his body. If Mary had known the real reason why the tomb was empty, she would not have been crying. Think about what she says. They have taken away my Lord. What an ironic complaint. If he's Lord, then nobody could take him anywhere without his consent. Amen? God is still sovereign here. Has she forgotten that? How often in our times of disappointment and sadness and grief, how often have we been like Mary? We're disappointed because like Mary, we don't understand the big picture of what God is doing. She only saw part of it. She saw Jesus die. She saw Him laid in the tomb. She saw the empty tomb. But she didn't have the big picture. She didn't know all the facts. She didn't know what God had in store for her. And we often suffer needless sorrow because we forget that God is in control. He is sovereign over all things and nothing in this world can thwart God's eternal purpose for our good and for His glory. Maybe I could ask you today what the angels had asked to Mary. Why are you weeping? Well, we move on to verses 14 through 17, where we find Mary meets Jesus. Look at verse 14. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Why, whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Why didn't Mary recognize the Lord? The text doesn't say. But several answers come to mind, don't they? Uh, first, she was not expecting Him. Right? She saw Jesus die. She saw Him laid in that tomb. And she thought that was final. She expected to find him laid out in the tomb like she had seen him on Friday evening. She did not expect to find him standing there talking with her. Secondly, she'd been weeping. And her eyes were likely blurred with tears and she was overcome with grief and not thinking clearly. Thirdly, Jesus may not have looked exactly the same as He did before His resurrection. He most certainly looked different from the time she had last seen His, his body having those been the blood poured out of it and, and the, the death of this horrible, beaten, bloody figure that she had seen on Friday this was not the same. At least not in the same way that she had seen him on Friday. But perhaps the main reason was that was maybe what, the same thing that had happened will happen later that day on Sunday afternoon. Jesus will meet two men on the road to Emmaus, two disciples of Jesus, as they walked along. And the Bible tells us in Luke 24, verse 16, that their eyes were restrained so that they did not know Him. And perhaps Jesus didn't want 
Mary to recognize him immediately so that he could teach her an important truth. Jesus teaches that truth by asking her questions. Jesus often taught by asking questions. So he asks her, Woman, why are you weeping? Did Jesus not know why she was weeping? Of course he knew. Why did he ask that question? Not for his sake, for hers. Then he asked her, Whom are you seeking? He knew who she was looking for. He knew she was looking for the dead body of Jesus. But he wants her to think about whom she's seeking. He knew that she was seeking his body. But I I think what he's saying through those questions is, (laughs) dearly loved woman, calls her that woman, dearly loved woman. He says, you know, you have a great Savior. Why do you weep? Why do you grieve? This Jesus that you say you're seeking, who do you think He is? What kind of Messiah have you come to seek? A dead one? Or a living one? It seems that Jesus means this maybe as a, as a gentle rebuke to Mary. And as we can see from what Mary says next, she is focusing too much on the body of Jesus. On Jesus as a man and not Jesus as the Son of God. And Jesus is opening her eyes and her heart to see Him for who He really is. And although Mary's grief still blinds her to the truth, she nevertheless seems to discern that this gardener, she thinks he's the gardener, taking care of the garden tomb there, she seems to think that he holds the the key to the quest, her quest for the Lord's body. And it's a bit ironic, I think, that Mary thinks this, because in a way, Jesus really is the great gardener. Jesus has shown himself to be, as Paul describes in Romans, and that he is the better, the true Adam. God had put Adam, the original man, in the garden to tend and to keep it. He was the gardener. But Jesus is the true, better Adam. He is everything that Adam failed to be. Adam disobeyed God in a garden. And Jesus perfectly obeyed and submitted to God, even to death on the cross in a garden. And so she pleads with him in verse 15, Sir, if you have taken, carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will take him. And Jesus answers with just one word. Mary. Mary, he says. And she turned to him and said, Rabboni. Which means my teacher. For Mary, it, it was seeing was not believing, it was hearing by which she believed. Wouldn't you have loved <laughs> to heard that one word the way that Mary heard it? What tenderness. What love, 
what mercy, what grace, what healing must have been conveyed by Jesus in the way that he spoke that one word to her, Mary. I can't help but recall the words of our Lord spoken earlier in John chapter 10. As Jesus taught and he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up another way the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep, listen to this, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice and the bay will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of the stranger. And then Jesus teaches, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me, and I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's what he's done for Mary. When the voice of the shepherd called Mary by name, she knew his voice, and immediately she recognized it was her Lord, and she called him my teacher. And we know from the Lord's words that Mary has already must have locked him in her grasp. The fact that, that Mary was clinging to Jesus shows that, first of all, that he, he was in a physical body. Jesus was not a phantom. He was not a hallucination. He was, he was not a ghost. He was raised bodily from the dead. He would ascend bodily into heaven and he will come again bodily in power and great glory. But it is as though she intended to keep on holding him so that she would never let him go again. She clung to Jesus. So let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with clinging to Jesus. I think the Lord wants us all to cling to Him, to worship Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love the Lord our God with everything that we are. To hold on to Jesus. But He says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. One commentator explained it this way. He was not refusing to be touched. We know that because you know, later that evening, he, he would tell the disciples that they could touch him. They, when Thomas, a week later, uh, appears, he tells him specifically, touch my hands, touch my side, see that it is me myself right he wasn't refusing to be touched but he was making it clear that she did not need to just hold on to him and not let him go physically for he had not yet ascended to the father he planned to remain with his disciples for a period of 40 days he would appear to them numerous times she didn't need to fear that he was going to vanish immediately. Ultimately, he would return to the Father. He speaks about that. He's returning to the Father. He's ascending to the Father. And he urged her to tell the disciples that he was going to do so. But not yet, <laughs> he says. He's not yet returned to the Father. She doesn't have to hold on to him. See, Mary's problem was not that she sought Jesus or clung to Jesus. As I said, that he wants us to seek him, to cling to him. But that she was still thinking of him from an earthly, physical standpoint. That's the problem. Jesus was signaling 
to, to Mary and to the disciples and to us that there was a new kind of relationship that he would have with his disciples. You know, after he would ascend, he, they would have his presence with them spiritually through his Holy Spirit, but they would not have him physically, just the same as we have today. He didn't leave the grave to just stay with them physically on earth. He left the grave so that he could give evidence of his life and ascend to the Father and send the Holy Spirit so that they could go out into all the world and proclaim that Jesus is alive. And so we have seen that Mary weeps and Mary worships. Thirdly, we see Mary witnesses. After telling Mary that she need not cling to him the way that she is because he's not yet ascended, he commissions her at the, in the middle of verse 17. He says, But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, this is truly amazing. This is the very first time in this gospel that Jesus calls his disciples his brothers. And although Jesus has this unique relationship with the Father, He calls Him my Father, He now says to, to Mary to tell them that He is also your Father and your God. How did they become children of God? Brothers and sisters of Christ? How do we become children of God? Brothers and sisters of Christ? The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, says, For it was fitting for Him, speaking about Christ, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. You see, Jesus went to the cross and suffered on our behalf taking his, our sins upon himself. And when we believe in him, and we are united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection so that we are in Christ. So much so that because he is the Son of God and we are in Christ, we are also children of God and brothers and sisters of Christ. He's not ashamed to call you brother, to call you sister. What a glorious truth. By Christ's death and resurrection, we have been placed in Christ. 1 John 1.12 says, But as many as received Him, to those who believed in His name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's what it means to be a Christian. Because of what Christ has done in His death and in His resurrection, His Father is your Father. Christ's God is your God. That's the message that Jesus gives to Mary to tell to others. In verse 18, she just does just that. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that He had spoken these things to her. Mary, first at the tomb, first to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ, first to speak with Him, and first to tell others the good news. Our Lord appears to her first. Mary Magdalene, out of whom the Lord had cast out seven demons. Mary Magdalene, who will never be one of the apostles. 
Mary Magdalene, who will never write a New Testament book. She will never become a great church leader or a preacher. Nevertheless, this woman was privileged to be the first to see Jesus and tell the good news. Don't you know how much Jesus loves people? Men and women, boys and girls. You know, God doesn't usually call the great or the mighty. He doesn't greatly use those who are the greatest and most powerful in this world. In fact, most of the time, God takes pleasure in taking people like Mary who are weak and weeping and faltering in their faith and and who are most in need. And He uses them for His glory. Because when we are weak, He is strong. And that's when the power of His resurrection, as Paul spoke about in Ephesians chapter 1, is, is made powerful in us when we proclaim Jesus died and He was buried and He was raised from the dead. And like Mary says, I have seen the Lord. Have you seen the Lord? Have you heard His voice for the first time today? Calling you to believe, to trust in His death and His resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins and to give you everlasting life? If you've heard His voice today, don't hesitate. Turn away from your sin. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in Him. And you will be saved. Romans 10 tells us, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And like Mary, your weeping will be turned to worship, which will result in a great witness to others. Let's stand together as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the message that you have given us of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and how you can turn our weeping into joy when we know that Jesus is alive, when we see the Lord, when we hear His voice calling us by name to believe in Him. And so we have come, God, to worship Jesus. And we're asking, God, that You would send us as witnesses that He is alive. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.